Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to welcome you here today. I'm glad to see that the place is starting to fill up a little better. I would like to also welcome any guests that we have here. Um, I'm glad to see you all, and I hope you enjoy what we have to say. Um, but before we really get started here, I'd really like to go to, go to the Lord in prayer. So if you join me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our time together here. We thank you for our worship time especially. Uh, I don't want to miss out on anything, so I want to be involved. And, and Father, I just uh, really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to be here. Uh, I want to also thank you and, and uh, pray for Pastor Jeff and, and his family. At this time, they're going through some terrible struggles with their, their grandbaby. But things are looking better, and, and we just continue to go to you and, and hope for your hope for your uh, guidance and direction in their lives, their strength, uh, strengthen them in uh, all that they do, and especially in their travels back home, they'll be headed here this way, and, and we just uh, pray for a safe trip back home, so we thank you. Uh, Father, we also would like, like to take time to pray for our country, it's a mess, and, and, and a lot of different facets, and, and we just ask for a revival, uh, that, that uh, your will be known, and, and, and just uh, help help those people who don't know you in a powerful way to come to know you closer. Uh, Father, we also ask that uh, today you uh, pour out your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us, and, and we ask that the Holy Spirit guide us and, and direct us and help us to understand the word that you have for us today, and uh, we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Uh, today... It's going to be a little bit different. It's, it's kind of a topical type of thing that we're going to do. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, I titled it, I guess the thing that I titled it is, a picture is worth a thousand words. But just like everything that I do, i got to question it. So I, set, I put a little note there behind it. It says, or is it? You know, Because oftentimes I think of a picture as just a moment in time. And really I think that's what it is. But, but it's, it's one of those things that... Uh, we uh, really need to take a good hard look and, and maybe a lot of words really helps us to understand a, a picture a lot better. Um, one of the things I'd also like to share with you is a short story. Um, I was in, I can't hardly see here, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to guess that Kevin's still sitting out there. And I told him that I would not try to embarrass him too terribly bad. Uh, we, we have a little men's group that we, we uh, get together on on Saturday. And a few weeks ago, uh, I was sitting in, in his um, shop, and I was sitting there, and they have a decoration uh, that, that was there, and it had a little tractor. It had a little tractor there beside it, and I thought it was just one of those kids kids' toys that was sitting there on it, and what I found out Saturday is uh, it was a tractor. I looked at it again, and but it was only a half a tractor, and I swore up and down that I seen a whole tractor there. He had, it was a decoration that he had uh, attached to a message board, and I thought, that was a whole tractor. That was a whole tractor the last time I saw it. Two weeks ago I had seen this. It was a whole tractor. But now the front end's cut off and it's attached to a board. Was I wrong, Kevin? It hasn't been a whole tractor for about 30 years. <laughs> I was seeing things, guys. I had actually seen that tractor as a whole piece of tractor, but I apparently was mistaken. <laughs> it's funny how our mind works in these things. Um, Pictures are worth a thousand words. Pictures we have in our mind, and this is one of those things that happened to me. I'd like to show you another picture. I can go ahead and go to that next picture. I, anytime I think of, anytime I think of this is not my job, uh, this picture comes to my mind. Well, actually not this picture. Because the picture that I had in my mind was a stump laying there, and this is, I think, some sort of groundhog or something, I'm not so sure. But this was close enough uh, for, for that. But anyhow, I wanted to bring this picture up because, like I said, we get stuff stuck in our mind, and oftentimes it's, it's not exactly the way that it is. Um, one of the things that I want to do is I, I had some inspiration uh, for, for these these messages that I have here today, uh, they come out of John 1.18, uh, no one seeks God, 
And the second one is John 14, 6, and it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the third inspiration, <coughs> excuse me, the third inspiration that I had is out of Exodus 3.14, uh, I am who I am. Now, we're going to be all over the Bible today. Uh, I couldn't just put what we were going to cover in this. So uh, I, I, I want to just say that we're going to be in Genesis, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, we're going to be in Galatians, we're going to be in 1 Kings, James, and Psalm. So we're going to be traveling pretty quick through some of this stuff. I'll, I'm not going to ask you to turn to everything, but I, I will try and do the best that I can to summarize or at least read parts of it. Uh, uh, as, as I can. Uh, picture is worth a thousand words, and I fully understand this. I fully understand what it's saying, but, but sometimes a picture just isn't enough. It just isn't enough. Now, we might think this is gross. We might think that, you know, there's a lazy worker there. Maybe something that uh, yeah, all kinds of thoughts come to mind, but this particular one for me was that's not my job. That's not my job. And I've, I've had all kinds of things. So I want, I want to, we're not going to go into this uh, any longer, other than uh, I, I want to go deeper into what is our picture of God. For if, you, if you would just bear with me for just a minute, just close your eyes and think of God. And what is that picture that you have of God in your mind? Uh, I mean, we all have something. Can go ahead and go to that first picture. This is this is a picture here that is a painting that was painted back in uh, somewhere around 1508 to 1512. It was Michelangelo uh, who had painted this portrait. It was actually on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, uh, painted on the ceiling, and it's it's a a very beautiful thing, uh, but it's it's one of those things that. It's, it's, it's really not complete. Uh, it's not complete. And, and there's a reason for that. Uh, I cropped this picture. I cropped this picture off the internet because it was a lot more revealing than, than what it is right here. Uh, Adam didn't hide anything uh, in, in his painting. But I wanted to share that with you, that it's not complete. Uh, go ahead and go to the next picture. Okay. This one's probably a lot more famous. Uh, we, we know what Leonardo da Vinci did with the Last Supper. Uh, this was done in, in 1495 or in the late 15th century. And, and this is Jesus and his disciples. Uh, it's, it's a very beautiful picture as well. But it shows God uh, at, at the table with his disciples. And I say that because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Okay, go to the next one, please. Sometimes we might think of as the lion or the lamb. Many of you have heard this, you know, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. You know, we, we understand that. Uh, these, are, these are all pictures that we might have uh, of Jesus or God in, in our life. How about, how about some of these others? Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus' resurrection, uh, you know, we might, we might see, think of that as, as a picture that we have in mind. Uh, how about Jesus on the cross? Jesus on the cross. I, I remember that, uh, that show, The Passion, where uh, the, the man who played, played Jesus was, I, I, I can still see that, that, that scene in that show, and it just stuck with me. And, and I think of that as possibly being you know, how it was. But it's, it's not accurate. It's, it's not 100% accurate. Uh, we, there's many, many resurrected images of, of Christ. Uh, we got Mary in the tomb, or you know, outside the tomb with the gardener. Um, how about uh, the Jesus walking on water? Can, can you remember some of that stuff? Um, how about Jesus fixing breakfast by the lake for his disciples? This was after his resurrection. Washing, washing his disciples' feet. What a powerful, powerful mess, uh, image that we might have there. A lot of word pictures. A lot of word pictures there. You know, we're gonna we're, we're gonna try and get some word pictures here, and, and I've selected three three words uh, from the Bible. 
Uh, Jesus used three words. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little about them later on. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But I've chosen some different words, and I believe they were God-inspired. I believe these are the words that he wanted me to, to share with you today to, to come up here and, and get a better picture of who, who God really is. And we're going to look at these three words today and try to get a better picture in our minds, and I hope and pray that that's what it will be. We're going to first start in, in with the, the uh, word good. And, and uh, this, this, the reason I started this is because it's from the beginning. Uh, if we go into the book of Genesis and, and we start to read about what God did in creation, um, he, he mentions this word good, uh, well, actually seven times. So uh, as we go through this, uh, chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis, it tells the story of creation. God created everything in heaven. And earth, and although it doesn't go into a lot of intricate detail, it gives us just what we really need to know. And, and in chapter one alone, seven times he mentions this word "good." Let me go through these quickly. I'll, I'll highlight what they are. But it's in verse number three. There, let there be light, and it was good. Genesis chapter one. In verse nine and ten, it says, "Let the seas gather." And, and the dry ground appeared, and it was good. Verse 16, it said, made, God made two great lights and the stars in the skies, and it was good. In verse 20, he went on to create creatures of the sea and the birds of the air, and it was good. Verse 25 goes on and said, God created living creatures and livestock of all kinds, and it was good. And then it goes on in verse 26, and it says, let, me, let, us, let us make mankind in our likeness to rule over everything and all that he had done. And it was very good. Seven times. When God mentions something seven times, I think we better listen. And there's a reason for that. Um, the number seven in the Bible is, it's, it's, it's symbolic. It's, it's symbolic, and, and it, again, a lot of it gets its sim symbolism right here in the creation. And, and what it symbolizes is basically it is perfect and it is complete. So when we look at all this, this is what the theologians have said, that now it's perfect and it's complete. So this number seven symbolizes. There's also a lot of other things in the Bible that have, have used this, some other examples that use this number seven. God rested on the seventh day, calling it holy. Uh, there, of course, seven days a week, and of course he rested on that, that seventh day. Uh, the Bible is originally divided. Uh, not may, maybe everybody doesn't know this, but the, originally the Bible was divided into seven different sections. Those sections, uh, like I say, originally, were uh, the major divisions was the law, the prophets, the writings, and the psalms. They, they were grouped together. <clears throat> Excuse me, they were written written together. Uh, the Gospels and the Acts, they were grouped together. And then the general epistles, Paul's epistles, and Revelation. So the seven divisions of the, the, early, the early Bible. In Matthew 13, uh, Jesus quoted as giving seven uh, parables. Uh, and then in Hebrew 7, uh, the titles to refer to Christ, there were seven of them that, that the writer of Hebrews said. Of course, in the book of Revelation, as we talk about it, there are seven churches, seven angels, seven seals, seven thunders, seven plagues, and seven trumpets. There are seven annual Jewish holidays. You get the idea. When seven is used in the Bible, we need to pay special attention. What is that? What is it all about? Jesus, our God wants to make it very clear that this is special. What he did was perfect, and it was complete. You know, some of those pictures that we've seen a little while ago either weren't complete, or they weren't perfect. And these are the pictures that God wanted to paint in, in his early creation, is that this is perfect, and this is complete. In Mark chapter 10, um, verse 18, there's another item that we must look at that Jesus talked about. Mark chapter 10 uh, says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and said, Good teacher, he asked me, 
what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. This good is used here, and Jesus is using that, that term, why are you calling me good? Only the only one is God. Now, something we have to understand here is what, what this man was, was trying to do. He was trying to earn his way by his good deeds into heaven. What good thing must I do to, etern to get eternal life? And Jesus was basically saying, you can do nothing to get there. You can do no good thing. Now, we know that there are all kinds of people that do good stuff. There are all kinds of people. Don't we pray? Isn't that a good thing? Don't we go to God in prayer and don't we go to Him in, in our, our decisions? And, and, and this is good that we do that. So why would Jesus say something like this? Don't we do kind acts to other people? Yeah. And I think God is pleased with that kind of stuff. I really do think that He, he expects us to do good things. So why this comment about no one is good except God alone? Because it's a different standard. It's a different standard that, that humans have, that, that, that mankind has, and that God has. God has a perfect way of doing things, and mankind has flaws. Uh, as, as God and Adam... Uh, gather together in chapter 2 uh, it says here that it is not good for man to be alone he says I will make a helper he says God I will make a helper for you so God and Adam go through uh, and name all the living creatures and the livestock and the birds and wild animals but no suitable helper was found for him so God made a woman from Adam's rib and as a helper. And then there's also one other helper that the Bible talks about. Mm -hmm. And Jesus talks about it in, in uh, John chapter 14. And he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help you. He will be with you forever. So we have helpers. We have helpers. Well, God certainly doesn't need helpers. He just got done creating all of heavens and earth and all the things that are in it. So he certainly doesn't need help. So this helper is for us. These helpers are for us. So why? Why do we need? Well, three clear pictures that I got out of, out of why we need help is, number one, we're lost. But, but the, one of the first things uh, for us, men, I'm speaking to you for procreation and reproduction process in the man's mind. I mean, that Adam was here first. He couldn't do it on his own. He couldn't do it. God could have. He created Adam. He could have done that. But as mankind goes, we couldn't do that. So he had to give us a help. And, and not just for reproduction, but also for companionship. Companionship, someone that can work with us, that can share our responsibilities, and, and that we don't have to be alone. And then the third reason is for relationship. And I think this is especially where the, the, the Holy Spirit comes in, is God wants us to be relational. He, he, has, he has a purpose for us. He wants us to have a relationship with Him first, but then He also wants us to have a relationship with one another. And, and, and this is how we get deep emotional, um, both spiritual and physical relationships with people, and, and God. You know? So we have help. We have a helper. Uh, a little bit of a summary. Uh, that, that we can go through. Uh, you can see the slides up. Uh, everything, everything God does is good. Everything He's done, everything in the past has always been good. Um, we see this in His creation that, that when He did something, uh, it was perfect and it was just exactly how He expected it to be. Uh, not by our standard, but by His perfect will and design, God reiterates this with the number seven. He actually emphasizes this with the number seven. It's perfect and complete. And basically it says that uh, the second thing that we can see is that, um, see here is what Jesus said, uh, no one is good except God alone, no matter how hard we may try to do good in our lives, we will always come up short of God's complete and total 
manner. And it, it always is. Number three, uh, we see that God's perfect timing, He will send a helper uh, when, when we need it. Uh, and even before we know we need help, He sends us what is good. And then, of course, the first thing, or the fourth thing that we see is also in the good news of the gospel. He gave us the scripture. Uh, this is good news that we are lost uh, without uh, a Savior. And this is what the good news is all about. He has, he has made it possible for all of us. The second word that we're going to look at today is the word truth. And um, the truth, how, how does the word truth help us to get a clearer picture of, of what, uh, what God is in our mind? Um, John uh, 1838, uh, Jesus was saying that I was born and came to the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth will listen to me. And there was a man standing there by the name of Pontius Pilate, and he said, what is truth? Well, that, that can be in our society today much the same question. What is the truth? You know, it seems like there's a gray area in the truth all the time. You know, but that's not the case with the Word. That's not the case with God. It's, it's clear, clear cut all the time with Him, and that's the problem with, that we have with truth as well. So I want to I want to go through some examples today of some of the truth of the Bible. Um, when when we talk about um, Moses and and his experiences in the Bible, it comes shortly after the creation. Um, there, there's a number of things that happened to Moses, uh, and, and, and they're the truth. It's what happened to Moses. And, and the story goes that he went uh, to uh, a mountain. It's called Mount Moreb. More, more, Moreb, maybe? M-O-R-E-B, Moreb. And, and uh, he went to this mountain, and, and they called it the Mountain of God, because God's presence was there, and, and they, they recognized that. And God told Moses to remove his sandals and that he was standing on holy ground. Now this is, this is Moses up on this mountain. And by the way, there's this burning bush that is up there. And, and it's not being consumed. And here is the voice of God coming to him and basically saying, remove your sandals. This is holy ground. He also told Moses to go to Pharaoh and free his people from bondage. He told him. Moses heard this. He knew exactly what. He argued with him. He said, well, hey, man, man, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> you know, I'm not very good at speech. You know, but what? Why, why do you pick me? He said, well, because you're my instrument. This is the way it's going to be. He also told Moses that when the people asked who had sent him, who, who, who told you to do this? God told him, I am that I am. Tell them, I am has sent me. Sent you here. There are a number of stories in the Bible that talk about God and how He's revealed Himself. And He revealed Himself in a number of different ways. He, he spoke to another man. His name was Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. And I'm not going to go through this. This is a very long story, by the way. But Elijah, uh, again, decided he was going to run to the mountain of God, Mount Moria. He was running in fear, as a matter of fact. There was a woman <laughs> chasing him. She said, by the end of the day, he says, God forbid it be that you're not dead by the end of this day. She was chasing him. going to kill him. So he ran. He went to God. He ran to God. And he went to this Mount Moreb. And, and after running from Jezebel, because, he, like I said, she was four by the end of the day, she would kill him. God said, go ahead and go out on the mountain. He was hiding. He was hiding in a cave. And, and he said, go ahead and go out on the mountain. And he said, I'm going to pass by. He said, I'm going to pass by. And he says, I want you to watch. I want you to see. So, so Elijah, he walks out of out, out, out the, the mouth of his cave. And, and this giant wind come by. And, and, this, and then eventually an earthquake. And, and not all at once, but then also a powerful fire, and, and it just completely destroyed, it completely destroyed the mountain. First, first the wind, then the earthquake, and then the fire, but God wasn't in that. 
he, he just recognized he wasn't in that. No. God was in control of that for sure because he made it happen. But then there was a whisper. A quiet whisper that came by. And God was in the whisper. Kim and I talked about a whisper earlier. God can reveal himself even in the quietest of whispers. There are also many other stories in the Bible that God has revealed himself, and, and sometimes in dreams. I think of the story of Mary and Joseph, where Mary was pregnant at this time and going to have the Son of God, and her husband-to-be found out about it. He said, I'm going to have to divorce this woman. She's not been faithful. And, and he was going to. He was going to. He, he, he didn't know why this was happening, but... But then God sent an angel named Gabriel. We don't even know his name. Sent an angel and said, wake this boy up. Wake him up. Well, man, don't wake him up. Give him a dream. Give him a dream. So he gave him a dream and told him, hey, this, this thing is from, this child is from the Holy Spirit. He said, I want you to name him Jesus because he is going to save his people. What a dream. Changed his mind. He went ahead and married Mary. And the sword went on from there. There's another Joseph in the Bible that had a dream. In fact, I think they called him a dreamer. He was a young man, a young boy. He had 11 brothers that didn't like him very well because he was one of the favored, favored ones. We've, we've, well, we've all had younger brothers, haven't we, Leland? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they're favored, sometimes they're not. But it's one of those things that, that it happens. And, and the older brothers didn't like him very well. As a matter of fact, that as the story goes, they actually sold him to some slave traders. And to make a long story short, this is what the dream was. This is what his dream was. As the young man was laying in bed, he said, we were binding sheaves of grain. Him and his brothers were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? To make a long story short, they did. They did. As the story goes, he became second to Pharaoh only, young Joseph did. And his brothers come crawling and saying, hey, we need food. They didn't know it was him right away. But Joseph, Joseph did. There are many other things that have happened. How about some visions? <laughs> kind of like my vision in your, <laughs> in your shop the other day. Peter had a vision. Peter had a vision. It was a little different than a dream. He was wide awake. He was up praying on his roof one night, one afternoon. And God come to him in a vision. And, and the sheep come down out of heaven. And it was all full of animals. And, of course, Peter being the person that he was, he says, I can't. What is this all about? I can't understand it. God tells him in a voice, kill and eat. And he said, Lord, I can't do that. Some of these are unclean animals. I can't do that. He said, don't call something holy that I've, I've created. They give Peter a whole different outlook on, on things. From then on, he started realizing Gentile and that bad after all. How about uh, some other visions that, that are probably a lot more popular than what we, we, we remember? Let's just go to the book of Revelation. Think of all the different visions that John had there about what the future has to bring. And some of that stuff hasn't even happened yet, but I believe that it will. There's no doubt in my mind. Some of this stuff will happen. We also have to understand that there are a certain amount of symbolism in, in the book of Revelation. So what is truth? Well, number one, you can see God is real. Number two, uh, God has revealed himself through the creation of heavens and the earth and everything in them, and he has revealed himself throughout time 
to so many different people in different ways, and he continues to reveal himself through the Holy Word and to those who read and seek his grace and his mercy. He is real. He reveals himself. He talks to us. He talks to lots of people. He has talked to people forever. Number four, he also wants very much to have a relationship with us. He loves us. He loves us and wants us to spend eternity with him and that he has made it possible for all of us who believe in him to trust in what he has done through Jesus Christ. This is the truth. This is the gospel of the truth. Our next slide is love, our last slide. Hopefully I won't go too far over on this. But this is, this is one that I would like you to turn your Bibles to. Uh, I think you probably all are familiar about where this is at. This is the love chapter. We're going to talk about love. So where should we start? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'd like to read some of this together. So we're going to read uh, chapter 13 verses 1 through 7. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may, uh, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not easily angered. It is not proud, I'm sorry. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now, I think I do pretty good with some of that stuff. Don't talk to Debbie yet. I think I do pretty good with some of that stuff, or at least some of the time I do pretty good. You know? Maybe I'm just learning. Maybe I haven't gotten it all down yet. But I know I don't get it all, all the time. In fact, when I get to reading this stuff, I really find that I fall short, especially when it gets to talking about Always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Man, that word always means always. And I'm not always. Especially when it comes to love. I fall short. I think we all do. But there's one thing that I know. There's one thing that I really do know. God doesn't. He doesn't fall short of this. This is what love is. This is exactly what it is. And this is what God is. How do we know that? How do we know that God is like this? Because the Lord tells us. God's words and actions, His words and His actions have proved that love is un His love is unconditional and righteous he loved us while we were still sinners, and by sending his beloved son to die for us, he paid that penalty for our sins. It's number two. It's unconditional. It goes on to say in John 3.16, that we know that one too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes as humans, we have a tendency to think that everything is about us. We do. I mean, we're special. God created us. And you know what we are? We are one of his creations. But let us read this one more time. Let us read it one more time. For God so loved the world. You're not just talking about us. There's a lot of things that God created when he created this world. He created the heavens and the earth. 
He created the animal, the sea, the creatures, everything in it. The stars and the skies, the sun, the moon, all of that. He's talking about that. He loves it in a different way than what we do. He has a different standard. We need to believe, yes, and we need to be saved, and a huge part, and we are a part of this world, yes, we are. And he loves us very much. But when Adam and Eve sinned, it affected more than just humankind. It affected the whole world and God that God had created, and, and it, it upset the natural and intended design that God had originally loved. But God loved us so much. He loved us so much that he wasn't going to leave it that way. He fixed it right off the bat. In Genesis 3.22, verses 22 through 24, Genesis 3, chapter, or verses 22 through 24, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good from evil. This was after Adam and Eve had broken God's rule and ate the forbidden fruit. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat from it and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work in the ground and, and which he had taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed it on the east side of the Garden of Eden, Jeroboam, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is our third word. God loved us so much. But it's not all about us. But one day, in Revelation 4, or Revelation 2, 7, one day, he says, Revelation 2, 7, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat the, of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Those who overcome. Amazing words. Amazing truth. Amazing ideas that, that come to our heart and our minds through Scripture. To him who overcomes will eat of the tree of life. To summarize everything, somewhat, uh, John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know this verse was talking about Jesus. It was also talking about His Holy Scripture. God's Word is powerful, and in fact it is more than just words. It is a love story for His world, His kingdom, and His people. Today we look at three of these words from Scripture. And it is my hope and prayer that it has helped develop a little better picture in our minds of who God is and what God is in our lives. Let Him be the one that we put our faith, hope, and love in. There's three words that prevail. Faith, hope, and love. Those three words are very important. But I would like to say this one comment. Couple of, couple of things yet. When I did a word count, in the NIV or the King James Version of the Bible, there are 783,137 words. The NIV has 727,969 words. The SV, 757, 439 words. And the NAS, if you're an avid reader, it has 782,815 words. That's a lot of words. I don't know what version you guys use, but that's a lot of words. You choose from. And they all mean something. And they all help us to get a picture of who God is. We've got a long ways to go. I would like to turn to one more piece of scripture, if I may, in clothing. Because we've been, in, been spending some time here in worship, we have to go to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms 
chapter 18. And understand this psalm is from David. This is David's picture in his mind of God. And, and this actually comes not from Psalms, but from 2 Samuel. This has been words that has been ringing true in his head for probably many, many, many years. But David made a song out of it. A song. It was to music. For the director of music of David, the servant of the Lord, he sang to the Lord the words of this song. When the, but when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul, he said these words. Listen to the words that David had in his mind as who God was. I love you, Lord. My strength. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and my horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my many enemies. The cords of death entangled me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. I'll stop right there. The words of David in his mind. When you close your eyes, what do you see is God. Keep reading that Bible. Keep reading that Bible. They're in there. And when you've got a question, go to the Holy Spirit and ask Him. Reveal this truth to me. Reveal your love. Help me to understand what this hope is all about. He will. There, it's, the truth is there. We've got, a, we've got a long ways to go to get talked through all them words. <laughs> Took me about three weeks to get these three down. So. <laughs> a week, a week of word, that ain't bad, isn't it? <laughs> and I don't think I touched but just the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> I think God has much, much more to reveal. Even about these words. I'm sure as I can be, there's a lot more to be learned. Let's go to God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for allowing me to get up here and to put my two cents worth in. Father, I thank you especially, though, for your revelation in this whole thing. I could have never done it without you. Your inspiration, your words, your, your scripture, your Holy Spirit has all guided me through this, and I just thank you for the opportunity. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of each and every person out here each person who sees this message, that you will speak to them through your word and through your Holy Spirit and guide them in what you want them to know. I thank you for our time together and we will continue our worship in Jesus' name. Amen.